let me try and give you in my typical kind of fast talking way, uh, three uh, sort of aha moments. All right. So the first one was the initial aha moment. I've been playing with AI for a long time. I am not technical. I'm AI adjacent. So I worked with the media lab with Marvin Minsky, who's one of the fathers of AI, but I was like the talk about AI person and not the coding AI person. Um, and so we, you know, so I've been through this process of, of working on, you know, on AI stuff for a while. And when ChatGPT came out, I realized something really weird had happened. The next day or two days later, I taught my undergrad entrepreneurship class, introduced chat to them. By the end of the first class, my students stopped paying attention about 10 minutes in. By the end of the first class, one of my undergrads had actually built working software that he said would have taken multiple days to do. Post on Twitter, he had venture capitalists offering him, um, you know, uh, meetings the next day. So that was like, okay, this is this is a big deal. And then by the Thursday, everyone had used AI for something. Cheating, obviously, but also getting tutoring advice, helping them with ideas. So that was thing number one. Um, the second kind of, um, you know, uh, of revelation, I think, actually came when I started talking to the AI companies. And I think it's really important to realize something. They have no idea what they're doing in our world. Um, they don't, no one really knows how this works. There's no instruction manual that's secretly out there. Nobody actually knows how good these systems are going to get. There's uh, strong divisions in people's minds between how good AI is going to get and how far we have left to go and, um, how quickly things are going to improve. But they weren't thinking of education at all when they released ChatGPT. They didn't realize they created a universal cheating tool and the universal tutor in one. And so I talked to these AI companies and they don't understand what they're doing. Like they're not focused on it. There's, they think about coding, they think about other stuff which is both empowering and terrifying, right? Empowering because it means you as educators can figure out how to use this best. And I think this is greatly empowering. It's ed tech in our own hands, but it's also a little bit terrifying because there isn't a greater authority to go to. Nobody's regulating this. Nobody knows what it's good or bad at. There's nobody who can tell you what the biases are. You have to figure it out yourself. So as educators, we have to think about that. And then the third piece of revelation was I went viral early on with the syllabus where I required AI use in my class. And that was great because I held people accountable for their AI work. If for free chat GPT, that worked fine, GPT 3.5. When GPT 4 came out, it performed better than my undergrads, right? And like, I'm, you know, Wharton's a good school or got good people. Like, I can't find the errors anymore. So it stopped being useful for me to say, use chat all you want. You're just responsible for the outcomes because I can't, that their outcomes are better with them not doing any work. So the learning just disappeared. So we have to adapt and in, as these systems get better, we have to adapt in deeper ways than just use it, don't use it. We have to be thinking hard about this because no one's doing the thinking for us. There's a list of the 1,016 most disrupted jobs, right? Uh, it doesn't mean disrupted. It overlaps with AI, which means you use AI. Teaching is basically most of the top 25, right? Business school professors, number 22. So like our fields are going <laughs> to change, but mostly if we do it right in very positive ways that free us from drudgery and help us be better educators. But again, we have to take a charge of what that means.